They call it fine wine, the concept of a PC component still delivering impressive performance years on from its release. I've been thinking about that a lot recently, bearing in mind the current situation in the graphics market specifically. Nvidia's Turing architecture, the RTX 20 series cards, weren't exactly well regarded at launch back in 2018. But with the RTX 2080 Ti, I'd say we're looking at fine wine at its best. Performance today battles it out with the recently released RTX 5060. It has more memory than the 5060, and its outputs don't decline on PCIe Gen 3 based PCs because it is a PCIe Gen 3 card. You can pick one up used for around $300, and to put it into context, you're getting a card that still handily outperforms the current generation consoles and still receives driver updates from Nvidia. Truth is, that while it took many, many years to fully prove out, the RTX 2080 Ti is a vindication for the seven-year-old Turing architecture, proving just how visionary the feature set was at a time where DirectX 12 Ultimate didn't even exist. And even today, Turing continues to deliver the lion's share of the neural rendering feature set that Nvidia continues to develop, and it too received the DLSS Transformer model upgrades. So this is fine wine with a chaser, if you like. Today, because of its machine learning hardware, it's doing things that nobody back at launch in 2018 could likely conceive of, and emphasizes the importance of an appropriate balance between compute power, features, and available VRAM. Let's take a couple of minutes to look at VRAM. I'm using the 5068 gigs here to test against the 11 gigabyte 2080 Ti, with a 16 gig 5060 Ti as an exemplar of a card that will have no memory problems at all, and will be a good chunk faster. You're seeing this here in Marvel's Spider-Man 2 on high settings with high RT at 1440p DLSS balanced, where the 8 gig 5060 completely collapses, while the RTX 2080 Ti powers ahead. 5060 Ti and 2080 Ti both have enough memory here, with the 5060 Ti about 20% ahead of 2080 Ti. That's in line with the kind of boost the 5060 Ti 16 gig has against the 5060, when that 8 gigabyte card is not VRAM constrained. More intriguing is Monster Hunter Wilds here. Again, high settings with high RT, DLSS balanced at 1440p. Now, I'm not quite sure why the 2080 Ti is so off pace against the 5060 at the beginning of the benchmark sequence, but later on, the game asks for a lot more VRAM. 2080 Ti's 11 gigs seems to be sufficient. The 5060 Ti's 16 gigs certainly is, but the 8 gig 5060 collapses again. I just kind of think that yesterday's flagship should be today's mainstream card, but that's got to be reflected in both compute, RT, and VRAM capabilities. It's very easy to produce examples like this where the 8 gig 5060 is unbalanced. Let's talk custom testing now. This is where we break free of an established benchmarking setup and explore, basically. The nature of benchmarks is apples to apples testing that can accommodate all vendors, but what if you want to test things like DLSS? What if you want to compare to consoles? It's stuff like this that I find interesting, and I'm eager to see how the RTX 2080 Ti and indeed the 5060 stack up. And we'll kick off with the freshly minted PS5 port of Forza Horizon 5. Back in the day, Playground Games gave us Xbox Series X equivalent settings for PC, and as they're essentially identical on PS5, here we go. In this visualization, 2080 Ti is still delivering 4K60 at console equivalent settings, and doing it with effective parity with the RTX 5060. PS5 has a 60fps VSync cap here, so we don't see its full GPU output, but it's 71 to 72 FPS on the RTX cards, with the 5060 having a 1% advantage. Textbook margin of error, all of which means we can turn off 4X MSAA and use NVIDIA DLAA, which is pretty nice for an increased image quality boost. This time it's the 2080 Ti with a 1 percentage point advantage over 5060, which again says to me margin of error. We only lose 2 or 3 frames per second in switching over from MSAA to DLAA which is a trade worth making. This kind of suggests we're faster than console with both cards, but not much faster. But Black Myth Wukong says otherwise. I ran this test in the 5060 review, but the 2080 Ti is again a ringer for the 5060. Another meaningless 1% differential between them. 
Both cards are around 20% faster than PS5, even though we're using the high quality textures that the console version doesn't use for some reason. And when instead of native 1080p, we're using DLSS performance mode at 4K output on both of those RTX cards. Both Forza and BMW say to me that you can't really pigeonhole GPUs as 1080p, 1440p or 4K cards. All depends on the workload and the settings. Seven years on, the RTX 2080 Ti is still capable of good results, very closely in line with today's mainstream offering, but with more memory. Alan Wake 2 though, that's a proper workout. Again, the 2080 Ti remains competitive. On these settings, the 5060 is around 6% ahead overall. But Alan Wake 2 uses features like RTX geometry and mesh shaders, and yet the Turing card is holding up precisely because of its forward-looking feature set. But it's fair to say that despite seeing so many great examples of how the 2080 Ti is still a fully viable card, maybe the outlook is just a little bit rose tinted. Yes, you can turn on all the latest RTX technologies, bar frame generation, but while the Transformer model super resolution tech runs pretty well on older cards, Turing and Ampere GPUs suffer badly with Transformer model ray reconstruction, which for RT titles is what I'd describe as a marquee feature. Here's how Alan Wake 2 shapes up with low settings and low RT in place. Uh, I'm seeing a 41 percentage point advantage in favour of the older CNN technology on the 2080 Ti. I didn't quite expect that, but there it is. Um, CNN is still fine, of course, but the Transformer model ray reconstruction tech really is a generation beyond. Being able to run it doesn't necessarily equate with it running well on older cards. It's a very similar story in Cyberpunk 2077 with RT and ray reconstruction enabled on Alex's optimized settings and indeed optimized RT settings. On the latter point there, we're talking RT lighting on medium and RT reflections on for the lion's share of the RT experience. But everything else is off. It's not so much the super resolution aspect of the transformer model causing this performance differential. It's ray reconstruction. But ultimately, it is a 60% improvement in using the older CNN model here in our city streaming test. Moving across to taxing Phantom Liberty content, it's a 51% performance improvement by not using the Transformer model's ray reconstruction. The Blackwell architecture isn't a problem here. Uh, the Transformer model flies on it. So the question needs to be asked about how well other upcoming future cutting edge NVIDIA ML features will fare on these first generation RTX cards. We've had an amazing run on Turing, all things being equal, and it will continue to run well, I guess, but there won't be a focus on the latest and greatest features running well on it. And some features may never appear at all. At the mainstream end of the market, frame generation and multi-frame gen are not quite the fire and forget FPS boosting solutions seen higher up in the stack, but MFG does have utility. Alan Wake 2 here is pretty much one of the worst games in terms of latency stacking up as we move through the MFG factors, and yet I'd say it's still worth having. And carefully tuned, even the 5060 is capable of some pretty decent results here, as you're seeing here with Black Myth Wukong, essentially running on better than PlayStation 5 settings, uh, 4x MFG enabled, and very good latency results there, I'd see. 1440p resolution DLSS balance mode. And yeah, while gen on gen performance gains or other price versus performance gains aren't quite what they were in the past, we've got to remember that the 2080 Ti was a power hungry top end GPU. So an area we should address concerns efficiency. Fabrication technology has come on a lot since Turing launched in 2018, and the 2080 Ti's 12 nanometer process is nowhere near as efficient as today's 4 nanometer, as used in Ada Lovelace and Blackwell GPUs, RTX 40 series and 50 series. The 2080 Ti has an astonishingly large 775 square millimeter die size up against the mere 181 square millimeters on the 5060. What this means to you is that power draw from the older card can be up to twice as much, sometimes even higher, which in turn means that a larger cooler is needed for quiet operation. And if you are thinking of buying a used 2080 Ti, while I benched the Founders Edition card, a third party alternative with a giant heat sink and three fans will likely give better overall results. But yeah, it goes without saying that today's budget cards 
are so much more efficient. They come in smaller form factors, which in turn means fewer issues in integrating them into smaller PCs. RTX 2080 Ti though, I like the narrative. When other cards of its era have been and gone, when the 8GB VRAM era is reaching its conclusion, there it is, still doing remarkably well overall. Finally seeing games tap into its full hardware feature set, still receiving decent driver updates, still outpacing the current generation consoles, even if we're not really at PS5 Pro levels. It uh, turns out that fine wine is perhaps a mixture of great hardware balance, future looking features and continuing support from its maker. Will today's 5090 enjoy similar levels of longevity? I guess I'll let you know in 2032.